Thank you guys, I appreciate you helping to carry the tune with Steve gone. So the announcements, you guys know we've got our last seminar of the year. Uh, next Monday they combine serving the church uh, from two nights into one night and I would love to see you gentlemen uh, come to that seminar. And then the last night for the children, 29th and May 6th is our victory night. We'll have details next week on our barbecue. Now, isn't it something, you know, God's timing. You get the Notre Dame Cathedral. You know, it's sad to see, and here is a great building uh, dedicated to the Lord. Look it up, it's about 850 years ago it was built. And then we're studying, of course, about this temple that, the, that Solomon built for the Lord 3,000 years ago, another man-made temple that did not last. And then it just seems like that's the point. You know, God is over all time, not man. Thank you, my brother. But only God can provide us all time, eternity with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I, I just, again, that's the timing as, as we go through and you think, how is it that God has us studying this today with what's going on in the world? But anyway, we're going to see this week about Solomon. He's, he's completing and he's dedicating and filling the temple and then this amazing prayer he has. And uh, So we've got three divisions this week, um, chapter 7 through 821 about God's temple. Uh, then we look at Solomon's prayer there through chapter 8, and at the end, the, the what I call believers' praises of all the people praising God. So this first division, there we are. Okay, so we see at the beginning here that this comparison, of course, and we have questions about it in the lesson about how, how big this palace was that Solomon built for himself and how long it took to build it. And then this, you have this obvious question in your mind, you know, to kind of judge Solomon's motives about how, what's he dedicating to the Lord, what's he dedicating to his own house. And before we do too much judging, we note in the Bible, the Bible does not judge Solomon at this point. And some guy said Saturday, maybe, you know, he had the whole nation committed to building the temple. Maybe he had a much smaller work crew. Or maybe his priorities were way out of whack. We don't know that, but before we, if we really want to pass some judgment, you know, we can look at, he did build a temple right, for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he married from another country. And we know back in Deuteronomy 7, there was clear instruction not to intermarry with these other nations. But as we know, before we want to go latch on to any sin of Solomon, we need to remember what Jesus said long ago in John 8. Uh, this is when that, that gang, that mob's there, and they're ready to stone the prostitute. And Jesus said, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone. And of course, everyone had to walk away. Solomon's got more troubles for us to consider before this year's out anyway. We'll get to that. So let's get back to the Lord's temple here. You know, we see this, and I, and I haven't had the opportunity to put pictures up, and, and I know it's kind of small there, but... Uh, but it was something else. You know, you see that, that Solomon hired this fella, uh, Hiram, from Tyre to come and make all of these uh, bronze and all the, furnace, the fancy furnishings around the temple, in the temple. And again, a point here being that Solomon spared no expense in building this temple for the name of the Lord. And one of the things I noticed, you can go through and see all these things, but these two giant pillars, you can see one in this picture said these pillars, they're made of bronze. They're there at the entry so that everybody that comes up to the temple sees them. They're eight, uh, 27 feet high. That's what 18 cubics is. And then they're 18 feet around. These things are gigantic. And it says at the top, the south pillar, he named it uh, Jachin, which means he establishes. And then on the north side, Boaz, in him is strength. So you see this talking about in him is the strength of the Lord and that he establishes everything. And it's reminiscent, I read one thing this week, of the two pillars that guided the Israelites for 40 years through the wilderness. 
At night they had the, uh, the pillar of fire, and by day they had the pillar of smoke. But anyway, it just it caught my attention. But you know, then you go on and you look, and there's all of these uh, gold. Also, in addition to all the, the, the bronze furnishings, they have all these gold, uh, the golden altar, the ten golden tables, the golden lampstands. And then one of the things you see out front is this giant bronze altar where all these sacrifices are going to be made for the atonement of sin. And you just you think, wow, how, you know, they just, it, you would, you'd never be able to, to finish all the sacrificing. And of course, all of this points to Jesus Christ. And in particular, that we would be studying about the perfect sacrifice of Christ this week in Holy Week, leading up to Easter. And then we get to the ark being brought to the temple. You know, you think about this, this, this dedication for this temple for the Lord. You know, it says Solomon summoned, summoned all the leaders, all the families of Israel, and you can, and they're all coming to dedicate uh, this temple, and they're sacrificing multitudes of sheep and cattle. And you just stop and you imagine what would it be like here in the United States if if we dedicated the nation's resources to building a temple for the name of the Lord, and then the nation stopped and said, "We're going to have this dedication to the Lord," you know, the time and the expense that went into this through the people, the, through the Israelites, you know, it's just, it's, you, can, you can read through it really fast, but really not think about, wow, what is going on here? And how the, how, how the people are honoring God here. And then we get to bringing the ark itself from the city of David up to the temple and the tent of meeting and all its, uh, its contents. And of course, we remember, we, and we studied it this year, back in 2 Samuel 6, when David is having the temple moved, remember it had been stolen by the Philistines and they put it on a cart and they're bringing it back. And this, and this fellow Uzzah reaches up to grab the cart when the oxen stumble. And because it, he touched it, the Lord struck him down, dead. And, and you know, this, this was because God had given the Israelites express instructions on the ark that no one was to touch the ark. It was only to be moved by the Levites, the priests, and it was only to be moved by these two acacia poles that went through the rings on the side of the ark. And God didn't say anything about putting it on a cart. Right? And so, and, but here you see uh, that Solomon, he is, at this point anyway, he is obedient to the Lord, and they are following the letter of the law, being obedient to the Lord in the way they bring the ark to the temple. And then we see there in verse 5 that they're sacrificing so many sheep and cattle they could not be recorded or counted. And it's just one more lesson pointing us to Jesus, isn't it? These, these animal sacrifices of old, they could never be perfect. They could never sacrifice enough. But we have Jesus as the perfect sacrifice. And as such, Jesus does not ask us to sacrifice more for our sin. Because he was the perfect sacrifice and instead again pointing us to obedience it's jesus himself said if you love me obey my commands obedience and incidentally it says there was nothing in the ark except the two stones the two tablets that moses had uh and it, and and we and it says that's when the israelites after they came out of egypt god gave them these and there's two things one there's a bit of a mystery what happened to Aaron's staff, his rod that had budded, and what happened to the jar of manna? We don't know. This is a mystery. But more important, we note this reference as Solomon, uh, as also as he prays, about this coming out of Egypt. You know, this is literally, we see this is the fulfillment of God's promise to his people. God's promise to Moses, you know, 500 years ago, the Israelites are in slavery. And here they are, literally, God has faithfully fulfilled this promise, and, and, and they are free, they are on top of the world, they have, a, a, you know, an opulence and richness that they're able to, to sacrifice to the Lord in this way. It's, it is, they have gone from one spectrum to the other, and you get to see this, you know, almost this, this, this ultimate uh, position in the history of God's people, and it's really cool to see when you put all God's people together all of them singularly focused on obeying and praising God. And then we see that 
when, when the priests withdrew after they had placed the ark into that most holy of places, then it says the cloud, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And it says such that the priests could not perform their service. And we remember this. We saw this back in Moses' day in Exodus 40. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. You know, when you read that, you might think it sounds kind of odd. Because we might think, man, would it, how cool would it be to be there in the presence of God when it literally, physically is filling the place, you know? But this is where we see not only is God good and is God love, but God is holy. You know, when you get to see that here, here are the priests themselves, and just like Moses back the tent of meeting, that they could not enter into this presence of God. And you know, it's because they sense this, this stark contrast between, between their human sinful nature and a perfect holy God. You know, that, that is reverence. That is holy. And when they say they could not go in there. And then this hit me back. You know, we're mirroring some of this with, with, in Chronicles. In Second Chronicles 7, it says that the entire assembly fell to their faces in worship, praising God. I just, I cannot imagine what that would be like. But isn't it something to think about? All, of, all the, the nation is all there in the presence of God and they fall to their faces. And as we close this division there in those last verses, 12 through 21, we see Solomon praising God for filling these promises to David for David's son to assume the throne and build this temple. And it takes us to this principle that God faithfully delivers his people and fills them with his presence. You know, question seven, you guys probably just finished discussing it this week. And it had, it had two great questions in there. It says, one... How does God dwell among his people today? And then that second question, how can you be sure God dwells in you? You know, we know from Scripture, and we had good references here, that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that he gives us his Holy Spirit, that we're indwelled with his Spirit. Uh, and incidentally, we also, and we've said it before, but we have up on the uh, administrative table at the front this Am I Sure booklet, which is great. For yourself, it's great to share with other people, and it's a, and it's a tool that BSF gives us to use. Uh, but Saturday morning, one of the leaders really put it uh, in a way that struck home with me. And he said, hey, we know, we're told by the Bible, we're, we have the Holy Spirit indwelled us. So it, it's not, we just, we, if we're just sitting around and we're just waiting and saying, well, I, I haven't heard from the Spirit, you know, and I really, I'm looking for a sign to give me faith, we've got it backwards. You know, we, that's where it, God is calling on us to step out boldly in faith. That is, that's what the, and, he's, and this particular leader said, get in the game. Because we all know when we start serving the Lord, when we're trusting in his promises, then we start seeing the Lord. Then we really start hearing from God. You know, when we, when we, when we step out of that boat, like Peter did, in faith, then our faith becomes sight. When we trust God to give our time, when we that give of our pride, whatever it may be, then we know that's when all of a sudden God starts talking to us very clearly. And it leads to, incidentally, again, last seminar next week is serving the church. And if you look around town for a group of men, you know, of hundreds of men studying God's word, we ought to be standing up and serving God. This whole room right here, all of us. That's a good challenge and a great way to finish the year. Well, let me finish preaching there and get back to teaching. <laughs> we'll get back now. We're into the second division, uh, Solomon's prayer here in chapter 8. And we really see some of Solomon's God-given wisdom in the way that he prays. And it may be, incidentally, I was reading, maybe the longest prayer in the Bible. But first... There in verse 22, Solomon praises God. He says, there is no God like you in heaven, above, or on earth. And then, now check this out. First, in verse 24, he praises God for his past faithfulness, fulfilling promises. And then in verse 25, Solomon prays a very bold prayer here. For God to keep his promises in the future. 
This is a valuable lesson on effective prayer. And Solomon is, is, is boldly but reverently calls on God in faith. And God certainly does want us to be able to take hold of and believe his promises. Now there's a difference. We don't have a we don't have a possession. We don't God doesn't owe us anything. But it is our job to act in faith on his promises. And so here Psalm is showing us. In fact, Hebrews 11 now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So it is when we act on God's promises that our faith does become sad. Because then we see God's faithfulness in fulfilling his promises. And then in more wise prayer here, we see as we get into verses 33 through 40, note how Solomon prays for God to forgive his people when they repent and turn to him. You know, he doesn't just pray for blessing on the Israelites. You know, these examples, uh, when they repent after being defeated by an enemy, which happens, and they return to the Lord. When they repent after there is no rain, when they repent after a famine or a plague comes on the land. And then, maybe the ultimate here, in verse 38, when Solomon says, he prays this prayer to forgive them uh, when, your people, when your people being aware of the afflictions of their own heart. Solomon prays, God, please hear their prayer. And there's a great point here that the man does not have to be righteous on her own accord for God to hear his prayers. Instead, the point is that we just have to be honest repentant and humble to the Lord. And that's when he loves to hear our prayers. And then verse 41, Solomon goes on uh, and, and he prays for God to hear the prayers of foreigners who come to pray to God. You know, God wanted his temple to be a place for all people to come and be able to pray to the one true God. And then Solomon prays for when God's people sin, and boy, did he get this right. He says, for there is no one who does not sin. And forgive your people, he prays, who have sinned against you. Forgive all the offenses they have committed against you. And that God know that we would be studying this during Holy Week leading up to Easter. Because we know from 1 John 1, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And here's the principle that God forgives everyone who repents and turns to Christ. You know, God gave the Israelites a missionary purpose, if you think about it. There when, when he's in, in his verse 43, after Solomon asked for God to hear the prayers of foreigners, he says, so that... All the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. You know, again, God did not just choose Israel and then reject the rest of the world. Instead, God's plan was to bless the entire world through the Israelites. And this should sound familiar to us. Now, Jesus did not just choose a few of us to save us and then forget about the rest of the world. You know, just to the contrary... When Jesus saved us, he gave us a job in his kingdom, didn't he? And, and I, uh, remember us re I remember us reading this last year in Romans, but in 2 Corinthians 5, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, that's us, the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We, that's us, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And it leads, of course, to the Great Commission. You know, Jesus told us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, not to sacrifice, but to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely... As we're studying about being the temple of the Lord's Spirit, Jesus said, As surely as I am with you always to the very end of this age. Then we can ask, what are we going to do this week? 
what are we going to do uh, to honor God's faithfulness, and especially what is our testimony to the world this week? All right, let's turn to this last division, and believers praise. You know, verse 44 there, when Solomon had finished praying, it says that he rose from the altar where he had been kneeling with his hands spread out towards heaven. And right off the bat there, that teaches us something about reverence and prayer to God. Here is basically the king of the free world at the time, and he's on his knees praising and praying to God. You know, we think about sometimes maybe we're in church and we think, well, gosh, I don't want to do something to draw attention to myself. And, I, you know, we start, we're not praying to impress other people, right? And it's so easy to get to worrying about that and say, you know what, I need to pray like I'm praying to God. And I'm not just doing it by rote, but this is the same Jesus who went to the cross for him. And then it says that he, Solomon stood, he blessed the whole assembly, and he said three things. First, praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel just as he promised. And he said, check this out, not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave to his servant Moses. And again, putting this in context, these promises that God made to Moses and the Israelites, imagine being in the dirt, making bricks out of mud and being whipped, and you're told you people are going to be here and on the richest place on the planet praising God. And you try, oh, well, we'll see. He did it, right? And then second, he says, uh, and this is Solomon's, again, God-given wisdom. When he's talking to the Israelites and he says, May he turn our, our hearts to him to walk in obedience to him and keep the commands, decrees, and laws he gave our ancestors. You know, he's literally showing us we can ask God, help us with, God, help me with my faith. Help me believe in it. Please help me obey Jesus. That's what he's teaching us from the wisest man on the planet. And then third, and may your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by His decrees and obey His commands uh, as it is at this time. And then we get to see this, this dedication of the temple. 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. I have no idea what that looks like. But that's incredible. You know, and that's just gratitude from the people. Uh, and then it says that uh, they had this festival went on for 14 days. And this is so cool. And the people said, bless the king. And then they went home. And you think about it, They've all been there. They've all sacrificed whatever it was. They, went, they left work. And they spent two weeks here praising God. And it says that they all went home joyful and glad in heart for all the good things the Lord had done for his servant David and his people Israel. And the principle being God is worthy of every praise we give him. You know, again, looking at God's timing for this week, and you think about, you know, all these sacrifices, we just read about thousands, that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And I, I was thinking about this week is Holy Week. You know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus lived a perfect life, and how did he do it? Just imagine, even in that one in the last week, his disciples, the people who poured into him, the fathers of faith that, help teach us, even them, that they fell asleep and couldn't pray with him, and then they literally, every single one of them to a T, abandoned him in the moment of truth. And yet, Jesus didn't stop and cuss them. He didn't stop and slap them. It would have been right to do so. That, he, that still, in obedience to the Father, that Jesus, in forgiveness for all of us, despite the sin, would go to the cross as a perfect sacrifice. How am I not praising Jesus more every single day? You know, what, what part of my well-deserved destiny to eternity without Jesus, which I do deserve, do I need to be praising and that I'm not going there? I'll never see it, thanks to him and his, and, his, and his sacrifice and promises to us. And how should these Israelites, their great praises to God at this temple, how should that influence my praise and worship this week to Jesus? What specifically can I give to Jesus this week? My time, my money, my pride, my testimony, my unforgiveness, all of those things. We should be inspired by this. Let's do this. Let's stand up and make this a holy week to remember by God's people. Let's pray. 
Dear God, we love you so much. We praise you for the God that you are. We praise you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross, how you could do it. We don't know, Lord, but we thank you so much for it. Please help each of us. Please help each of our lives, Lord, to be a praise to you, to be a service to you, to be obedient to you, to spread your love to the rest of this world, Lord. And may you help us, this group of men, Lord. We pray to strengthen our faith and strengthen our walk for you, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, man. Have a great Easter.